Hey guys, so go ahead and working on problem number three here. Um, this problem asks us to design a sequential logic circuit to recognize a four bit sequence. So, this is a really interesting type of problem. Uh, this is a pretty typical problem that you'll see for these, different than what you've seen so far on the homework, um, in that uh, there, there's a lot that's going on here. Um, we have a four bit sequence that we're trying to recognize, which means that not only do we need to watch that we've read the sequence, but we also need to be able to read in some input. Uh, then we also need an output to tell us when we've recognized the sequence. Um, and so those couple of things, realizing them is the hard part. But since I've just told you, there you go. Okay, so um, if you looked at any of the other videos, you've seen that your state table, it pretty typically looks like this, but um, you know you need your present state and you need your next state. We're dealing with, uh, with memory devices here, so you're always gonna have your present state, you're always gonna have your next state. We're dealing with an input, so you gotta have an input in there. We're dealing with an output, so you gotta have an output in there. And then for memory devices, we're always trying to optimize the input into the flip-flop, right? So at the end of the day, what we're really trying to get after is this: these two columns right here, the D flip-flop inputs. Those are gonna be what's really driving our circuit. Um, you've probably hopefully seen the other, the intro to Finite State Machines video, uh, which explained how finite state machines are designed around flip-flops. Um, and in particular, in our cases, we like to use D flip-flops. So <laughs> the first thing that we want to take a look at, actually, is this sequence. Um, because you're not going to know exactly how to put this table until you've figured out exactly how you need to approach this sequence. So the way that I always like to think of these problems, the way, place I like to start, is how many states do we need? Well, let's think. We're always going to need at least one, right? You've got to start somewhere. Okay, so uh, you could have a finite state machine with just one state, but it wouldn't be that interesting, so you're probably going to need at least two. But so the way that I'm going to think of it is, okay, we need to start somewhere. Okay, here's our first state. Just because I'm going to call it state A. All right, now we need some place to go once we've recognized the first part of the sequence. So I'm going to make another state for that, state B. Okay, <laughs> well, by that same logic, we need some place to go when we recognize the next part of the sequence, which I'll call state C. And then we need some place to go when we recognize the next part of the sequence, which I'll call state D. Now here's the tricky part. <laughs> The sequence is given to us as 1001. Uh, notice though, you can actually see some similar logic um, in problem four. Uh, when we're given the sequence that we're trying to get through, the first value and the last value are the same. And that's kind of how you identify what the actual sequence is, right? The real sequence that we're looking for is 100, right? This extra one here tells us, okay, we've, we're repeating our sequence. Um, so, four states ought to do it. We start somewhere, we've got one, zero, zero, and then we'll figure out what happens with this, this final one here. <laughs> um, well, so now that we know that we have our four states, uh, we can use our nifty little equation, two to the x equals the number of states, and we can say two to the x equals four, so x equals two, we need two D flip-flops. So that's how you know that you're gonna have two present states, two next states, and two D flip-flop inputs. <laughs> now once you've done that, that's most of the difficulty here. Um, <laughs> it's really not that bad. Uh, now I wanna introduce the concept of the state assignment table. This is by large an optional step. Um, let's kind of section this off here. Um, So the whole point of the state assignment table 
is to let us uh, really keep track of what these states mean. <laughs> it's really useful to call this, you know, state A and state B, state C, state D, but how do we put that into our truth table? Uh, in this table, there isn't really a good way to put it into this, this kind of state table. There, there's another type of intermediate table you can do, which um, maybe we'll go over. But the basic idea here is we need some binary representation of each of these states so that we can enter them into our state table. So, for no reason in particular, I'm going to call state A 0, 0, state B 0, 1, state Z 1, state C 1, 0, and state D 1, 1. Awesome. So now we've got a good way of transferring our states into our state table. Cool. <coughs> so now that we've got that information down, let's look at how this circuit's actually going to function. Well, let's start with the state diagram, because that's uh, probably going to make filling out this table easier. So, <coughs> we need to think, uh, we're doing a mealy-type machine, and a mealy-type finite state machine uh, the current state depends on the output, uh, or sorry, the output depends on the current state and the input. So let's figure out actually first how our output's going to behave. Well, the only reason why we have the output in the first place is to tell us that uh, our sequence has been realized. And once we've, we've correctly identified our sequence, then we want to output a 1. So by that logic, We've hit our sequence, let's output a 1. Awesome. <coughs> so now, uh, let's use that information and fill in this table and then come back from the, sorry, fill in the diagram and then come back from the diagram to fill in our table. <coughs> so, state A, we said was our initial state. State A is we start here and we have no part of our sequence. We haven't even started our sequence. We're waiting for that first one to enter our sequence so that we can say, all right, let's move on to the next step here. Um, so if we're in state A and we receive a zero, we need to think, have we started our sequence? Well, the first value we're looking for is one. Right? So if we're in state A and we receive a zero, we haven't started our sequence, right? We haven't, we haven't progressed our sequence. So if we're in state A and we receive a zero, we better just stay in state A. So we're going to go ahead and loop back around to state A. We input a zero and we output a zero because we haven't completed our sequence. <coughs> okay. Well, what if we're in state A? and we receive a 1. Well, 1 is the first part of our sequence, and we said that state B was for when we received the first part of our sequence. So, we're going to go ahead and jump over to B. So if we're in state A and we receive a 1, we go to state B and we output a 0. <laughs> awesome. So that's how you're going to go about filling in this whole state diagram, is you're going to say, if I'm in state D, and I receive a 0, what do I do, and what do I output? And if I'm in state D, and I receive a 1, what do I do, and what do I output? And that's where you draw all your arrows. Now, with all the information that you have already, you know how to do that. <coughs> um, now, A, B, C, and D, and this, all this interaction, right, is where we need to come over to the state assignment table to transfer over into the state table. So, let's look at this first column here. We said, if we're in state A, right? That was the first case we looked at. Well, notice I called state A 0, 0. So if we look at present state, 0, 0. So we could call that state A, right? Which we did. So what this first row is saying here is that we're in state A. We're in state 0, 0. So we're in state A, and we've just received a 0. Well. We already said what would happen in that case. We're in state A. If we receive a zero, then we're going to loop back around to state A. 
So if we're in state A and we receive a zero, we need to go to state A, state zero, zero. And we output a zero. Okay, well what if we're in state A and we receive a one? So now we have to go and find which row that is on our truth table, because it's not this one, right? We're looking for the present state is zero, zero, and the input is zero. So present state is zero, zero, and the input is one. Okay, so we're in state A and we receive a one, so now we need to go to state B. Well, we said state B was zero, one. So, zero, one. Perfect. I mean, the rest of this is just super simple, right? <laughs> so let's just pick a random one. One, one, zero. So our present state is state one, zero. Which state is that? Well, we check our state assignment table. One, zero is state C. Okay, so we're in state C, right? And we said our input was one. So if we're in state C and our input is one, well, maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Let's, let's continue with B. I apologize. So let's say we're in state B and we receive a zero. Well, what's going to happen? If we're in state B and we receive a zero, we just received the next part of our sequence, right? So we want to go to state C. We received a zero, but we haven't completed our sequence, so we output a zero. And then if we're in state C and we receive a zero, well, zero is the next part of our sequence, right? So we need to go to state D. So we received a zero, and we have not completed our sequence yet, so we need to <laughs> output a zero. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so now we can actually start looking at this. So let's go find on our truth table, or on our state table, where we're in state C and we receive a zero. So we want present state is one zero, and input is zero. So present state is one zero, input is zero. What did we say? We said that's when we go to state D. So we go to state 1, 1, and we output a 0. All right. And if you want to think of it in slightly uh, more direct terms, right, you can think of it as when you're in state B, you have a 1 in your sequence. When you're in state C, you've got a 1, 0 in your sequence. When you're in state D, you've got a 1, 0, 0 in your sequence. So you can see that as you progress through this loop, you should be progressing through your sequence. And we are. So now what you need to go ahead and do is finish filling in this table, or the state diagram, based on the information that I've already shown you, and then use that to fill in the rest of your state table. Now from there, it's all the same as what we've done in other problems. The whole thing that we're after is the, the D flip-flop inputs anyway. So we're going to go ahead and figure out what these columns should be. We're going to k-map them, and then we've got our circuit. Cool. So let's just look, take a couple examples here. And uh, this is what's going to happen for all of these types of problems. This is why we like to work with D flip-flops. <laughs> uh, when we look at a D flip-flop, let's get its uh, behavior table up here. Right, so the behavior table for a D flip-flop is on the falling edge of a clock cycle. The output, uh, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, let's rewrite this somewhere you can see it. Okay, you can see that much better. All right, on the falling edge of a clock cycle for a D flip-flop, the next output is just going to be the same as what the output just was. On the rising edge of a clock cycle, your next output is just going to be the same as what the input was. Now, I've explained this a couple of times in office hours and in other videos and everything, but the only time we can say anything definitive about the output of a D flip-flop is on the rising edge. Right? <laughs> Depending on how long your clock cycle is, we don't know how long that Q of T plus 1 has just been Q of T. Right? But we know that on a rising edge, definitively, 
our next state output is the same as our input. So that means that when we do this analysis, that's the only time that we're really interested in, is on that rising edge. So what we want to make sure is that on that rising edge, our input and our next state output are the same. Well, luckily, we just worked through that. We just figured out what our next state output is, and we're trying to figure out what our next state input is, but we just decided they're going to be the same thing, because that's how a flip-flop works. So let's look at the first example here. If we want to figure out what the inputs for the D flip flop need to be, it's going to be the same as the next state. All right, and let's look at um, index two here, right? Zero, one, zero. If we want to know what the input for the D flip flops is going to be, it's just going to be the same as the next state. In this case, one, one. And in this case, <clears throat> zero, one. And as you do more of these problems, as you're studying for your final and everything, you'll see that all of these problems are exactly the same like this. So, with all the information given here, you can very easily complete the rest of this problem and then go back to week two stuff. You can, you can K-map your functions, you can build your circuit, shouldn't be any problem.